Welcome to the Consulus Global Circle. My name is Gino Bulan and I am the Country Director of Consulus Philippines. I am honored to be your host for today's Global Circle. Let's kickstart our program with our global survey results. COVID-19 has fundamentally shifted our perception of our cities and called into question how well they have been built to withstand the challenges of the present and the future. To discover more about people's current perception in the value and gaps of their cities, we sent out a global survey asking people from all around the world to rate their cities on its livability, sustainability, smart developments, and community. In the category of city planning, out of the four dimensions measured, ratings on commercial development and residential spaces, which are market-driven, were generally positive with over 38.9% and 38.1% rating either strong or very strong, respectively. Conversely, traffic and transportation networks and public spaces fared poorly with over 51.2% and 46.2 rating poor or very poor, respectively. These results highlight the challenges in development of public infrastructure in tandem with the growth of urban development. In terms of quality of life, the overall best performing dimension was educational opportunities with 41.5% rating their city strong or very strong and the worst performing aspect was child-friendly city developments with 43.9% rating their city poor or very poor. Community services and social services also saw a higher percentage of people voting poor or very poor. These results reflect a need to build cities that are more inclusive and community-focused. In terms of smart city developments, our survey showed that majority rated their city poor in the accessibility of the internet and speed of internet usage, as well as in regards to the level of smart application and technology that has improved standards of life or that has enabled inclusion and accessibility. These results reflect that the digital transformation of cities are still lacking in increasing living standards, accessibility, or inclusion. Focusing on environment and sustainability, out of the four dimensions measured, water quality was the best performing dimension with 43.4% rating their city's water quality as strong or very strong. Conversely, the biggest area of weakness identified was the scale and quality of green initiatives, with over 48.5% who rated their city's level of green initiatives poor or very poor. These results highlight the challenge for city planners to ensure provision of quality green public spaces and sustainable green developments and the need to address this challenge through green master planning at a national or even regional level. Shifting our view to look at community-centered and inclusive development, on a whole, a majority of people mostly agreed that their city has its own unique sense of identity with a common spirit that embraces a diversity of faith and culture. However, on whether their city promotes sustainable development through ensuring inclusive and shared economic opportunities for all, or on whether their city takes a human-first approach to infrastructure and technology advancements, our survey results showed that most people neither agreed nor disagreed. This reflects a possible fact that inclusive and human-first developments are an area of gap that people have generally not thought about. Our survey has shown a general trend and sentiment where people do not have a particularly high perception of their city's developments. Is there a need to remodel our current methods of urban development? Wow! What an insightful survey! 
it has definitely left us with a lot to think about in terms of city and urban development. So, is there a need to remodel our current methods of urban development? To offer their perspectives on this question, today's talk features Stanislav Lenz, Regional Director of Consulus Europe and Consulus Slovakia Country Director, and Mr. Lawrence Pe, Consulus Head of Integrated Development. If someone were to ask you what is your favorite place on earth, I'm sure you would be able to picture somewhere immediately in your mind. This place you are visualizing is surely one filled with specific emotions or memories. Our lives are intimately bound to physical spaces. Our times may be the most digital of all ages in human history, but what we have seen, especially during COVID-19, is that it is challenging and not sustainable for us to live, work and play in a digital-only world. It is human nature to connect with our environments just as it is human nature to connect with others. This is why whenever we at Consulus work on a place or urban transformation project, we begin not from looking at the infrastructure, but by first paying attention to what is most human about the environment. Every town and city will have both tangible and non-tangible features. The more deeply aware you are of them, the deeper your appreciation of the value of your town or city. Especially through time spent in COVID-19 lockdowns, people are becoming acutely aware of the features that create value and maybe even of shortfalls of their cities. Why should you as an individual, even if you are not an urban planner or work in the government, care about the value or the development of your city? Let me share an insight that I had previously shared at a global conference about co-governance in 2019 about the value of places. I use the word places here loosely, referring to physical areas like cities, townships, or even master plan developments and malls. In our work in placemaking and urban transformation, what we found was that the more that people cared about a place, the greater the overall positive impact on a place's attractiveness and economic growth. In other words, a place is attractive not just because of great infrastructure, but also how well it creates a desire among people to care and be part of its identity. To illustrate the impact of connections and identity to a city, we can say that when a city is purely focused inwardly and overly focused on production, it stagnates without a sense of openness. Or if a city is focused only on growth, but without identity, it fails to inspire. Indeed, what we want to see in a city is that it is open and connected to the world, but at the same time that people feel a sense of belonging and identity to shape inspired growth. We define this as high creative growth. Today, more than ever, we need to honestly and factually embrace the dual importance of identity and connections. Too often, the development of cities is overly focused on infrastructure and technology developments and not focused enough on the building of identities and deep connections within and beyond the city. Now, COVID-19 has aggravated the various pre-existing challenges for cities today, which are demographic changes, economic slowdown, weakened links between economic growth, employment and social progress, growing disparities with poor getting poorer, increasing social polarization, spatial segregation and the so-called society dropouts. Lastly, 
urban sprawl, with urban ecosystems. It is also clear that in COVID-19, the cities whose people care more about their environment and fellow citizens were able to adapt and get involved on doing their part in helping to overcome the pandemic's immense challenges. There are important, there are opportunities to turn today's threats and challenges into positive outcomes and growth. But to do this, a new way of shaping the growth of cities is essential. A new methodology and planning framework are needed to guide this journey towards enabling cities and its inhabitants to grow in mutual responsibility by respecting and challenging roles, organizations and communities, and by combating polarization. Now I would like to invite my colleague Lawrence Pe to share more about a methodology to guide and shape the development of deeply human-centered cities of purpose. Thank you, Steno. As Steno shared, the growth of a place is connected to its identity and its interconnections within, among inhabitants, civil organizations, businesses, government, faith, and cultural communities, and also with the world outside. It is clear that a city's growth is not a given. It requires active co-creation among its people. The notion of the purpose of a city matters, and it requires a holistic view. Such an approach, one of purpose and identity-driven co-creation, will allow for the creation of a new business or economic model of the city where the underlying strength is not based solely on the creating conditions that allow only the exceptional and best talent to succeed, but make it possible for everyone to achieve success based on individual uniqueness. The true characteristics of such a new model should be inclusiveness and care, enabling everyone to grow in identity and to unleash new hidden synergies of purposefulness, connectedness, and mutual empowering. Such a comprehensive approach will not only create and secure investments, but assure long-lasting stability, sustainability, and resilience. The challenge is to create conditions for this and shape the steps towards this. We need every individual to feel safe and yet to be challenged to contribute a constant dialogue on collective growth. This process can be time-consuming, but it is worth it. At the heart of the matter, there's one belief which we have discovered to be true in each one of our projects on city and community development. In today's competitive world, there is no lack of solutions, expertise and resources. What is lacking is the unique and systematic ability to bring people together, facilitating all stakeholders to sit at a common table with a warm but clear invitation to give his or her unique contribution. A genuinely new culture has to enter into the scene and grow into reality as the project advances. This is why we created PlaceCore, a holistic development method for place development and transformation. This method inspired by the concept of the economy of communion puts human purpose at its core, catalyzed by a constant interconnected evolution of plants, products and person. Supported by a global team of ad counselors with renowned global partners in planning and infrastructure, this program brings together experts in business strategy, master planning, architectural design, organizational review, development implementation, and place branding. A people-focused approach is an underlying that will help pre private developers and government agencies to examine issues from a multidisciplinary perspective and ensure maximum effectiveness. A successful project needs to integrate the best the place or site 
can offer in terms of physical attributes and the value it can bring to the communities in terms of social economic benefits. Especially today, people focus and holistic solutions are critical as economies, markets and communities strive to leave behind the devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and to bring forth projects that will usher in fresh hopes and new horizons. Thank you, Stanislav and Lawrence, for the great talk on people-focused urban developments and sharing about PlayScore holistic development method. For our next segment, we will have our panel discussion. First, we have Lucia Staselova, Deputy Mayor of the City of Batislava. So how does your background as an architect impact the way you look at the sustainable development of the entire city of Bratislava? Hello again. Thank you for inviting me. So before I joined uh, communal policy, my professional career was focused on uh, social affairs, namely helping children and young people in Slovakia. And after that, after 15 years, I, I started to work as a communal politician. And through this experience, I can also be somehow connected uh, for the issue what I am doing now. This background, my study and uh, my experience allows me to be useful part of the team of experts and politicians who now make in the closest team of collaborators with the new mayor. Now it is uh, two years. At the same time, also my social experience can be perfectly be combined with my original education. But if we speak about system sustainability, in this entry, I am convinced that every one of our activities must, at the end, the needs of the concrete people of the city. It cannot be only about the roads or, or prettier building or the bigger, nice green parks, but especially about meaning or thinking for whom we here are and to be sensitive enough to the needs of specific groups of people whom we must not only think about them, but also to hear what are their needs and the problems. So, for example, the needs of young families or mothers with kids or all the people are completely different when we are speaking about homeless people. So such a specific approach to solving problems and meeting the needs of specific people on one hand and building an environment for these same people on the other hand guarantee that sustainability development of the city at the end is not only the word but it has sense for us. Thank you for sharing with us all those experiences. So your experiences will surely be of great value and have enriched our listeners. Now, let's look at the current situation that affects all of us globally. I am pertaining to the impact of COVID-19. How important do you think it is for cities to be developed in an inclusive manner where there is special emphasis on communal growth and opportunities are accessible for all levels of society? You know, we have a lot of plans, but when we compare it after two years to our election program and we compare our results, it is encouraging that many of the key objectives have been fulfilled and some of them has been up and running. But despite the fact that coronavirus is not planned, it became the main topic of the municipality activities in the first half of this year. We have to adjust pandemic plan a lot of decision and the direction of the city politicians. Also, fight to protect the most groups of the population was the key idea behind our activity. Sometimes very difficult to put together a whole information, uh, what we have in our level 
and also to fulfill our responsibilities for the inhabitants of the city. I have to say that Bratislava was the first city in the Slovakia which underlined that it's very important to put together experts and to to frame for the next days, next month, the next years so we can see now to how to react and how to use the data. And on the other hand, year 2020 taught us a lot and pandemic teach us. We now are sure that how great a cohesive, a responsible and solidarity feeling our inhabitants of Bratislava because there was there were a lot of uh, volunteers who helped us for example not only the normal people but also a lot of experts come to our office to help us to create a pandemic plan not only for one day but uh, plan for the next months as i mentioned i'm sure that we survive <laughs> survive uh, with the uh, i'm proud of the inhabitants of the city and uh, also we received international award how we manage all of this necessary step in the city we create for example small separate town from containers for homeless people in a situation when they are sick for example so I think this growing level of trust among municipality and inhabitants of the town is a key stone for next month, next time. And we are really now very strong uh, and we now know better how to manage town in crisis times. And it is significant capital for the next years and what will happen next year. I think we now can feel very strong. And also I can add, for example, the background in my bag. It's not real, but on this red table is our sentence, what we have used in campaign when we speak to public, that our strongest thing is to be disciplined, is our strategy. And we use it every time when we communicate with the public. So this is one small, small part of our strategy. <laughs> Thank you again for your sharing. Dr. Eugene Pedeliso, CEO of Tan Tok Seng Hospital and Central Health, Singapore, and lead of Health City Novena Master Plan 2030. So, Health City Novena today is an impressive network of medical and research facilities. Right in the heart of Singapore, situated cohesively alongside both commercial and residential spaces. What was the initial vision you had when you first embarked on this development? Well, it's certainly be a journey um, over a number of years as we reimagine what healthcare uh, should be going into the future. One of the key points that uh, we envisioned was that um, healthcare would really be delivered in networks of care and that we needed to ensure that as we build the hub, we'll would be very much connected to all the spokes in the community that we serve. This allowed us very much to rethink the way we build a medical campus. So the traditional medical campus really kept everybody out, right? And we wanted to bring everybody in and we, we wanted to flip that model around and how do we imagine the health city as being very much connected to all the communities around us. So one of the things we wanted to do was very much to allow for flow to happen through the hub and allow for that connectivity to enable people to pass through the medical hub. And so what we did was very much design the bridges, the underpasses, as well as the connections to allow for that flow to happen. And this allowed also for retail to happen on the ground floor of Health City Novena, while the healthcare facilities and the care facilities were on the upper levels and the support on the lower levels. So this planning allowed us to very much ensure that connectivity was smooth. And that was the first order of that vision. The second order is that we knew we were going to deliver care beyond the hospital and we needed to connect up with the rest of the neighborhoods that we serve in the community. And we needed, therefore, to have a hub and spoke designed to how our healthcare facilities were embedded within the hub, as well as with satellites out there in the communities that we serve. 
So today we have actually uh, up to 100 community health posts all across the neighbourhoods that we serve. And we serve a population of about 1.4 million uh, people living in central Singapore. So that connects them back to this hub and builds that relationship in care. Therefore builds a future hospital that was not very much centric on just patients coming to our doorstep, but how we serve the residents in our various communities around the hospital. It's really interesting to have this vision of a medical hub well integrated in the community and serving the citizenry. Now, aligned with this overall vision, how was Health City Novena designed to ensure inclusiveness and sustainability? And also, how did this Health City Novena catalyze growth as a hub for healthcare innovation? Well, we clearly didn't want Health City Novena to just be a place for our patients, but we also wanted it to be a place for our staff. Because if we look after our staff, our staff can best look after our patients. And then there are visitors to the Health City as well. Um, so altogether, we get about 10,000 visitors a day coming through our doorsteps. And that is a huge number. And we needed to make sure that we had a good design that was safe for them that were also ease of navigation and ease of accessibility. Those are things that really makes Health City open and welcoming. And we wanted to give them also a sense of arrival when they came into the Health City such that they felt that this was a great place for healing, a great place for working and for learning as well because we have a huge number of medical students, nursing students that are here as part of our teaching program in the hospital. Um, so that is for inclusiveness and for innovation. Well, the bottom line is this, healthcare needs to change because the population is shifting, right? Um, we are facing a fast aging population. And we're looking at chronic disease burden going up and want to be a more inclusive society for those that may live with disability for part of their lives. And for us, taking innovation to do it as skill is the challenge. Innovations are always stuck at pilot stage. Um, in fact, there's a term for it, right? Pilot pieties, right? It's just chronic pilots. And how do you move pilots into system level change that you want to see organizationally? So we take the approach of what we call an innovation cycle. And the innovation cycle starts with approaching everything from a care redesign perspective and using technology to enable that care model that we like, and then using a workforce transformation model to make sure that that is sustainable for the long run. So with this innovation cycle, which is an iterative process, we drive quite a number of innovation projects as systems change, including building a future command center for the hospital that it works very much like airport traffic control tower, to be able to see real time where all our patients are and to be able to optimize flow within the system. So that allows us to really embed innovation at the system level scale. And for that, we have the Center for Healthcare Innovation that is also embedded here on campus to be the catalyst for some of that change. The center also allows us to partner with innovation centers across the world to be able to bring ideas to bear upon our ecosystem here in Health City Novena, but also allows us to uplift our innovation so that we can share and learn with the world. And that outside in and inside out approach to innovation will be a key to why this is an exciting hub for learning as well as for delivering great care. Thank you for sharing this initiative. It's quite innovative. Huh? And also thank you for sharing um, your process on how not to get stuck with the pilot because we're not airline companies, as they say. Uh, I remember uh -huh. this joke in my previous company. Now I'd like to move on to a topic which affects all of us. And this has something to do with COVID-19. With the global pandemic shining a limelight on global healthcare systems and development models, can you share with us on how it has affected or possibly reshaped the purpose and role of Health City Novena? And based on that, how does Health City Novena intend to evolve? So going forward, there are three things that I think would be really important as we rethink the new normal 
for healthcare. Of course, we will want to plan better for the next outbreak. And this time around, we will not be just looking at the hospital response, but we are looking at how we can, as a hospital, look after the communities that are around us, a more concerted community outbreak response, especially in response to a large pandemic of COVID-19 size or even bigger. The second thing is we clearly needed to design facilities um, much better such that they could be easily scaled up for pandemic use. So when we hit using all close to 600 beds at NCID, we needed to overflow this into the main hospital and we needed the main hospital facilities to be ramped up very quickly so that they would be ready for more COVID patients. So how do we ensure safety by design? And part of safety by design is also about how we ensure the well-being of the workforce, especially uh, during the times of crisis, especially prolonged crisis. So that will be a key design factor as we look at it in order to create the right environment and the support facilities that would be able to give us that longer sustainable fight against a crisis. The second area is that we realize that as we take care beyond the hospital, one of the key advantages is really the use of innovation and technology to enable that process to happen. Because one of the things that would be important is that as the hospital gears up a fight against an outbreak, that the business continuity for the existing patients and the regular patients needed very much to shift to the community. And we needed to ensure that they will receive the appropriate care during this crisis. And if not, the excess mortality would be very high from non-COVID causes. Um, so the, the key part of it is how do we build those networks to be able to come together such that we could move patients fairly quickly. And I think digitalization is going to be a big part. Telehealth has certainly uh, taken off in a big way, much better than policy can effect. <laughs> you know, a crisis clearly is a big pending platform that allows for that continuity. But we do need to move beyond business continuity as a mental model so that we can really go upstream and downstream in delivering better care, such that only the patients that require hospital care comes to the hospital. The last part of it is thinking about um, the future of healthcare and wanting very much to build the capabilities in our staff to be able to learn and learn and relearn and such that they have the agility to change and to respond. And for us, that has been very much giving them the skill sets and the tools for them to be able to do so. It's almost like giving them a fishing rod so that they will fish for life rather than just pumping them with knowledge and skills. We wanted them to also have the ability to change. And so from improvement skills to innovation skills to research tools, this is the culture of inquiry that we want to embed within Health City Novena with all our healthcare partners and extending that knowledge into the community as well as we work with community-based partners. I hope that will give us a better health system and also ready us for the next outbreak in the near future. Thank you for sharing these experiences no? and also your response to COVID-19. And also your way moving forward, which is really based on innovation. Thank you very much for having me and keep safe and keep well. From the Philippines, we have Attorney Engelbert Caronan Jr., President and CEO of the Development Academy of the Philippines. I would like to ask this first question. In light of COVID-19, how do you envision the future of towns and cities in the Philippines? And how do you think development and transformation strategies need to be changed to enable this new vision? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Gino. Even before COVID-19 pandemic, communities have constantly been facing developmental issues and challenges. This brings more attention to the interrelatedness of these perennial issues of economic instability, weak health system, food insecurity, and the socio-economic disparities that arise out of these things. In essence, it revealed the weakness of our systems at the most fundamental level. The complexity of this interdependence of issues compound the difficulty to identify and prioritize appropriate actions, both at the macro and the micro level. Therefore, demand a new, more robust, more transformative and adaptive solutions, both at the national level and of course, at the local levels. 
In essence, and without necessarily going into the details of it, the development and transformation strategies at the national level should enhance the local government's ability to innovate its own solutions. And for the local government, on the other hand, to provide the necessary creative spaces, the future of towns and cities, therefore, must be one that is able to implement new governance models, new policy frameworks, policies and rules that allows its system to anticipate and quickly adapt to the changing environment. Thank you for sharing your vision, Attorney Caronan. A vision which I think allows us to come out stronger post-COVID-19 in the Philippines. Now, as President and CEO of DAP, what do you see as the role of DAP in shaping this envisioned future city and towns in the Philippines? The DAP's mandate have always been to assist the government in achieving its developmental goals. However, for the past years, the emphasis have largely been directed towards the national government. And we believe that to a large extent, we have been effective and successful in doing so. This time, however, we would like to rein our sight due to their heightened role in national development. We will attempt to deliver the same level of expertise to our LGUs, but this time focusing on the broad area of innovation, productivity, and foresight. In addition, drawing from our experiences in the past and merging it with the most current available knowledge that we have, we prepared programs and projects along the lines of creative and smart communities, which we feel journeys of LGUs towards the envisioned future of the city. Yes, creative and innovative cities are indeed key in improving the lives of the citizenship. Now, as a fellow Filipino, Attorney Corona, we know that in the Philippines, we are known to have such a strong culture of community. How important do you think is community development in the development of future cities? How do you think city planning and development can help shape more inclusiveness and embrace communities? In a sense, community development is both an end and a means in itself that is characterized as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Stability of the community itself is paramount. Policies, structures, and processes are meaningless unless this translates to the development of each component of the community. And in the same token, the most responsive policy, structure, and processes are best derived from the community itself, a community that allows for a plurality and effective participation of its constituents. In a very real sense, therefore, the future of cities depends on or rests largely with the development of the community. It is therefore imperative as a necessary first step that policymakers or the task city planning and development should recognize this and have an appreciation of the potential that exists in engaging the community. We feel that this may be operationalized by adopting a people-centric policy approach that we are trying to introduce, which regards public engagement and participation as the core developmental philosophy. To employ a people-centered thinking means to prioritize citizens' needs and demands in designing and deliver public goods. It recognizes the central role of the citizens in the community by recognizing that, number one, citizens are a source of the complexities of the cities and they are the ones experiencing the scenarios on the ground. And number two, that they are the beneficiaries of the services and programs to be implemented by the local government. And number three, that they are participants and contributors. Hence, they play a key role in the development and improvement of their community. Combined with other strategies should contribute to a more developed and resilient communities. Thank you for highlighting the importance of a participation of the community and the citizens in development. Architect Tan Xiaoyan, Group Chief Innovation Officer of CPG Corporation, Singapore. As one of the leading providers of infrastructure, building management, and consultancy services in Asia Pacific, could you share with us some of the key challenges facing sustainable urban and regional planning in APAP in light of COVID-19? Thanks, Gino, for the question. And uh, obviously, COVID-19 has brought about many, many challenges. Huh? And I will just want to mention three main ones today. First, some of the pre-COVID-19 original development trajectories right, and assumptions pre-COVID-19 have been thrown off. Some obvious examples are developments that are related to, for example, aviation and uh, tourism. And uh, this has resulted in spin-off and uh, 
downstream implication, right? And it has resulted in many uh, short-term developmental uncertainties. So there's the first one. And the second one would be this, is that new questions regarding public health have emerged. For example, how can cities be enabled to be pandemic resilient? So questions like that, I think in the past, people think about it too much. But today, pandemic resilience has become a new important dimension in uh, urban planning and design. And then the third one is that currently we know the whole world is having this urgency to contain the spread of virus as well as to administer the vaccination programs. These are certainly very important, but inevitably because of this attention towards this uh, containment and uh, vaccine programs, somehow the attention and focus has been drawn away from maybe some of the more complex and pressing issues, long-term issues that require in-depth studies and uh, forward planning. So there are many of these pressing needs currently somehow the, we have been distracted away from all this yes it seems there are a lot of challenges and change brought about by covid 19. the world as me as we know it now may not be the same again now show again in terms of urban and regional planning what changes or shifts do you think the infrastructure and building industry in apac needs to see to ensure that we are creating a sustainable environment for the future. Thanks for the question. I'm hopeful that the resultant mindset change will act as catalyst towards positive urban transformation that is more environmentally uh, sustainable and socially inclusive. So what are the urban transformations that I think should happen? And I think they are happening, they are emerging and gathering pace. So I like to see seven trends uh, and uh, these trends are, let, let me name them. Uh, so the first one is about high density, compact and biophilic urban form. Okay, high density, compact cities, for example, like Singapore, that embrace greenery brings various benefits, productivity, accessibility, efficiency and livability. And it may appear counterintuitive, but high density, compact cities supported by good healthcare and social infrastructure and services has demonstrated ability to contain virus spread. So that's one. A second one is that this uh, pandemic has taught us about the importance of having a distributed model. So a dense compact urban form will have to be enabled by uh, two new modifiers. The first one is about a decentralized distributed model. Work, learn and social activities should embrace a hybrid model of mixing physical and remote uh, connection. It helps to ease the peak pressure on infrastructure demand, as well as potentially reducing carbon footprint. And then the second modifier is about smart technology and infrastructure. The importance of having inclusive accessibility of smart technology and infrastructure, as well as innovative services to the urban dwellers is important. And then I see another trend evolving is this thing called localization. It's about the importance of cities having global connectivity as well as local resilience. The US and China economic decoupling as well as the supply chain disruption during the pandemic has hastened this development of localization. So cities will continue to be connected and trade globally, but at the same time, becoming more resilient by building up local capabilities to produce essential products and supplies. This will also contribute to development for local jobs. So more local jobs will be created, more local businesses and uh, opportunities for education as well as uh, social inclusivity. So the next thing that will emerge from this localized supply chain would be this, is that they must adopt a business model that eliminate waste and pollution. All end of life products must be fed back into a circular economy as a form of resources. And ultimately, all human activities require energy. So the only way for our, our, um, for our world to work is to transit towards a low carbon energy sources and industries. So the next frontier, the sixth pillar that I think must happen is that the world must work together in meeting the targets set in the 216 uh, Paris Agreement. And signs are that uh, the nations are determined to take action. And I am hopeful that a green economy will emerge and then provide new uh, opportunities to uh, re-energize the world's economy. 
And then if we can do these six things, hopefully the, the seventh pillar, the last, last thing that will happen is about how we come together to go into reforestry as well as ecological regeneration. This one relates back to the complexity. So while complex cities would allow urbanization to continue and accommodate the growing population, by remaining compact and uh, produce and consume sustainably and transit to an energy system that's eventually carbon neutral, we will stop all acts of deforestation and environmental degradation. In fact, by building a global green economy to encourage nations endowed with natural resources, including Philippines, to monetize their environmental services, the process will encourage more nations to invest in reforestry and uh, ecological regeneration. So these are the seven developments I'm hopeful that will happen, and then we will play our part to champion it, to promote it. I am also very hopeful. The trends you mentioned are very encouraging, especially from an ecological point of view, which I think would lead up to a better living environment for all. I hope we could have it sustained. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think? are the core elements in shaping sustainable developments. And could you share how CPG is actively taking steps to ensure that it is shaping more sustainable cities of the future? Okay, in the light of uh, COVID-19, at CPG, we are fully convinced that the crisis has opened up mindset for change that was perhaps not possible before. So I think we see there's a window of opportunity and I think we should not simply seek to restore to where we were before COVID-19. As we build back better, we should exert positive influence to bring about a post-pandemic transformation that goes beyond making profit, but also do good. And uh, on this point, we do believe that more and more companies have realized the importance of doing good and that doing good can be profitable. And um, in order to better contribute in this direction, we have identified six broad pillars of focus areas and we have organized our staff community to come together to research, collaborate and conduct innovation development. These six pillars are pandemic resilience, digital economy, climate change, health and wellness, security and resilience, as well as environmental sustainability. We have also stepped up on our applied research through both internal commitment of resources and funding as well as external collaboration. And since 2019, CBG has also formed an innovation management office, which is headed by me as the chief innovation officer to oversee the corporate wide innovation efforts. In the coming year, in 2021, our wish is this, is that as the world is preparing to reset and restart, we have put in place plans to step up our R&D and innovation endeavor to identify and harness new opportunities to influence positive change to urban environments. We are ready to partner like-minded people and companies to do good together. Once again, thank you, Architect Xiaoyan, for your very inspiring insights. With that, we have come to the end of the Consulus Global Circle. We would like to thank everyone who made today's meeting possible. Our speakers, our panel speakers, we hope that you enjoyed today's program on the theme, Places of Purpose, Post-COVID-19. Finally, we would like to thank you all for being with us today. We look forward to bringing you more insights in the future meetings. Have a great weekend ahead.